happy to answer a question. Yes. I haven't, I missed my book club, so they might have discussed this already, but I'm thinking a little bit of autism was this other, what, what, would, what would you have seen it as, like sort of self-absorption and not uh, Friend, you're talking about my main yeah. character? Yeah. Um, she's asking if he has autism, um, and he, um, I didn't really diagnose him, <laughs> but, uh, but a lot of people have for me, and what, I, what I'm told by people that uh, work with high-functioning Asperger's is that he's a perfect example of that, in that, he, um, in that he can be really obsessive and really get into things, has troubles with human communications, but all in all can be, um, you know, an upstanding citizen, functioning citizen. Yes? I had a sailboat down in Blaine, and I was having breakfast there one day, and I was talking to newly transferred border patrol officer right. who was up in the border and had been transferred from the southern border, the Mexican border, from here. He pointed out how bored he was. He pointed out, too, that he caught one guy three times down there one day. <laughs> yeah. well, that's, that's what I, I found, too, is that they, uh, you know, when they tripled the border patrol up here, they were mostly sending out people from, you know, the San Diego area and, and so on. And, and they are. They're used to rounding, you know, up hundreds of people at night and, and bringing them down. And so up here, it, it, it's such a different uh, system altogether. And, and so, um, yeah, I found that, that they would they would get bored. And the people that were up here and knew how to work this place were saying that they what they don't even train you how to track people down there, or you know that they, they didn't think that they came up here with with much in the way of skills. But it also was just they. It might have been arguably overkill as far as how many border patrol agents were suddenly jammed up here, and and so you suddenly have this situation out in the out in the farming valley out there where most of the vehicles are, are green and white border patrol agents going back and forth and seeing the same farmers out there all day long, and uh, so it it, it kind of got to a strange overkill point, which is kind of what I was trying to capture. So. Well, overkill, in my opinion, when Positano came up for a visit one hour. But for about a week, you um, couldn't get past the border. Yeah, right. <coughs> Others? Uh, the bird watching element mm -hmm. and all the Andy Goldsworthy kind of artwork imitation by Brandon are such a big part of his character. And I'm just curious what made you decide to include <coughs> those two things? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I, I, Brandon kind of came to me. A, a, I suddenly knew that he was six foot eight and that he was highly unusual and, and then I was riding around with the Border Patrol agents and I and I kept noticing how much time they had on their hands and I noticed how many beautiful birds were flying around. And so it, it occurred to me that they would have plenty of time to do a lot of birding. And uh, and then I also, um, so I went out and I spent a whole lot of time with the with the guy who has the birding record in Whatcom County, um, Joe Mesh. And it was a great guy and, we, and we'd walk into the forest and, and there'd suddenly be this flurry of, of, of bird song and he could suddenly list off the ten different birds that we were hearing and, and I just thought it was a, uh, a kind of a great metaphor for, for somebody who sees a whole world that most of us miss. And so I kind of like that, that power for, for Brandon to have that as a, as a personality quirk and thread. And then as far as the art in, the, in, in that kind of uh, temporary environmental art that, that Andy Goldsworthy is famous for, and um, probably some of you aren't familiar with him though, he's a Scottish artist who does such things as built these, these elaborate ice structures that uh, um, they build before sunrise and then when sunrise hits and, and they, they melt and falls apart. He's just into this temporary beauty that he creates. And, um, and I just thought it was a nice, uh, a nice touch for, for how he's tuned into other things, it seemed to fit with his personality and made for, a, made for a kind of a fun rhythm through the book that you go through all this tension and then all of a sudden you're watching for burns and you got art. Uh, my father grew up along the 49th parallel <clears throat> in the southeastern corner of Alberta, and I found the connection with Brandon and the birds to be very much like my dad, oh, because he knew the name and the sound of so many different birds in that area. Yeah. It was really quite intriguing. Well, I, what I find is that uh, um, <coughs> just this general area, I, I, I moved away for 10 years, and one of the reasons I like to write about this area so much is, is that the geography alone to me is so exotic. You know, all of Western Oregon, Western Washington, and Western BC are are just these these stunning places. And that if we, it's it, I think it's hard to think about where you live as exotic, 
but um, the landscape here is just so stunning and bountiful and and for me uh, it always kind of surprises me when so many uh, novelists and writers in this area you know set novels indoors or, or have them set in uh, Italy or, or somewhere else when we've got such <coughs> wonderful uh, terrain to write about and it, it seems to have a powerful effect on the people and the story yeah. uh, can you tell us about your growing up and your sense of humor and how it developed because the phrase you know, from the sublime to the ridiculous to came back a few times. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, well, I don't know. I, you know, I just have my own... Uh, you have to... You, write, writing a novel is a strange uh, endeavor, and, and, uh, and I haven't really determined whether or not um, writing makes you neurotic or neurotics are drawn to writing. <laughs> but uh, but um, what, what I find... Because you, you basically have to entertain yourself first and you have to create something that strikes you as real first and so you're, you're, you're that, that first wall of audience and, and I don't really set out to to write something that's going to be funny or humorous but once I create characters and put them into motion if if, if they start to do things that, that uh, amuse me or, or crack me up I, I don't I don't cut it out you know I, I figure that the reader deserves um, uh, you know, a break in the rhythm. So I like to have, the, you know, ideally I like to have the full variety of life that you feel like you can squeeze behind between the pages. That you've got, you've got emotion and sadness and and humor and ridiculousness and and all the things, all the kind of chaos of life that we we experience. So did you move a lot when you were young? Uh, no, I was I was I was pretty much in the Seattle area um, most all my youth and and into college. But then I uh, when I became a journalist, I went to the East Coast an extended amount of time and, and uh, was in Washington DC and Virginia and, uh, with a wife who was pleading to come back west. <laughs> Norm was such a beautifully drawn character and was so sympathetic and had more problems than anybody can imagine. <laughs> and uh, I, I found him to be tremendously interesting and compelling and a few other things. Um, where did he come from? Ah, well, that, I appreciate all that. It's, it's funny, the different, it's, it, you know, you write a book and it's kind of like a Rorschach test for the reader. Because I've had some people go, boy, that norm, Stan Norm. You know? and, uh, but um, uh, he came from, uh, in part, the, the, uh, the dairy farmer that I, that, I, that I hung out with down in, in uh, you know, where I live in, in southwestern Washington, in the Olympia area. And he, he was a guy that was single-handedly running his dairy, and he had a, a whole bunch of problems that just seemed to be piling up. He had the mastitis in the herd, and troubles with his wife. And, and so I took a lot from what he had, and then I just tripled it, you know, as far as... <laughs> because I, I, wanted, I wanted Norm, I just basically kept piling, piling the dung higher and higher on his shoulders and see if he could handle it. And, uh, and I thought it, it kind of worked for, uh, for kind of realism of what it's what it's like to be a dairy farmer, but also just kind of for, uh, you know, a bit of comic uh, dynamic, too. Well, thank you for Norm. Yeah. <laughs> you got the perfect voice for Norm. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's what he sounds like in my head. Have you got a fix on the number of border people that are reading your book and what they think about? Oh, that, that's interesting. I, it's really impossible to... To know, I don't get that kind of breakdown on, on, on book sales and that sort of thing. But I, I do, I get a lot of, um, I do get a lot of emails from uh, Canadians that have read it and and uh, Whatcom County people. I mean, so I get, I get a big stretch of people, and I get, also get a big stretch of uh, uh, of readers who no longer live either you know in, in southern BC or northern Washington State, but you know will contact me from Kansas and go, my God, you know, you're writing about my my area and. Uh, and, and, uh, and I, I, I got an email from a guy in, in Scotland who said, uh, I've just been loving border songs and I've been following it on Google Earth. That geography out there is incredible. You know? <laughs> uh, so, so I've been hearing a variety of, of, of responses. And I, I meant the border police. Oh, the border police. Um, well, yeah, I, did, I heard from them uh, uh, quite a bit. Uh, but no, it was, it, was, it was mostly all really good. And, uh, and right after it, it got published and I came up and gave a reading in Bellingham, 
one of them got me on the phone right after I was done because they were they were working and said, "Can you meet us in the Safeway parking lot?" And so I I, I meet in the Safeway parking lot, and then the three agents who helped me the most descend in their different vehicles, and, and I gave them signed copies of the book. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that was the, uh, um, but no, they they seem to. Uh, they, you know, they've got a sense of humor about their, their work, and, and they feel like I captured the spirit of it. And, and, and I, I, I respect the, you know, the, the uh, courage of, and uh, the danger that they face. Um, and, and the ones that I've talked to you know, seem comfortable with it. I heard a couple grumblers that I don't know, but <laughs> you never please everybody. <laughs> yes? I thought, I think, was it Sophie was interesting because she kind of connected with everyone, knew what was going on, and she was filming everything all the time. Yeah. And I wondered how you chose that character and what she represents to you. Ah, what, what, um, why I ch what, what does Sophie mean to me as a, as a character? And Sophie is the, uh, the, she's kind of at the center of the book in some ways because she's a, a masseuse who knows everybody's secrets. <laughs> and. Um, and, uh, and she just seems to be prying, and you're not quite sure why she's prying. Well, what, what she was for me, essentially, is I, I, I had these you know, five different characters whose heads I'm going through, and I'm two, two sides of the border, and I kind of needed a character who was kind of keeping track of it. So she kind of helped serve as a narrator, I felt, um, you know, a narrator within the story. And uh, in some ways, she, she was doing what, what I've always done as a journalist and what I kind of try to do as a novelist is really get my arms around an area and really try to understand it. And so the fact that she was doing that um, kind of served as a vehicle to pry into all these characters' lives in a way that might make some sense. And I also just kind of liked her, just the, the, the gentle mystery as to what the hell is she up to? So, yeah. Yes? The title seems a very appropriate one. Can you speak to how easily it came to you? Or? Ah, ah the, how easily did the title come to me? Well, it was about the tenth title that came to me. It was the, it was a it was it was a title that was picked by a uh, I I gave the an early copy to six different uh, friends, including a bookseller down in Cannon Beach, Oregon, and, and I was gonna I offered dinner to the one who came up with the best title, and she came up with Border Songs, and so. I <laughs> Went down there and bought her dinner, and now we're even. So, uh, <laughs> but um, it's really, it's really. Uh, I, I never, when I when I was always trying to write and publish novels, I, I had no idea just how important titles and, and covers are. Um, and and like the the covers, the the second cover. This is a paperback, uh, early advanced uh, edition of what the the ran in the states as the. Um, American cover, and it's so different than what ran in Canada, which is, you know, um, a much more gentle uh, image. And then they, and then for the paperback, because they were afraid that this was scaring too many people, they they went for uh, a cow crossing the road, and uh, I, you know, with the theory that cows don't frighten people, I guess. But it, but as a as a writer, you're you're just kind of always hoping that that they come up with some irresistible cover, and that you come up with some irresistible title. Because otherwise, you look at your book in that lonely sea of books at Barnes and Noble, and it, it kind of looks daunting. That cow on zero red. <laughs> yeah, the cow is red on zero red. <laughs> well, no, no, I'm in my mind it is. I have no idea where that is. Probably in New Mexico. So you didn't have anything to do with picking the covers? Well, when it comes to picking covers, uh, they basically just want me to say I love it. And so uh, when I don't. There, there's some consternation, but it doesn't always, uh, I don't always prevail. It's kind of what I've found. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm determined to become more obstinate, to become more of a prima donna. Just like the makeup. Just like the makeup. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah. another, another one of my false stands. <laughs>